2016. Um, and was really blown away by that experience. Um, was, it was really inspiring. Um, I was sort of thinking back to it um, and, and sort of the crowd that was there, the audience, the kinds of workshops that were being given. And I was trying to think of ways that I could contribute or give back to this community. Um, and it occurred to me that, you know, there are a lot of people out there in the world right now making arguments about technology and organizing. Uh, they're making arguments about the relationship between uh, technology and data and power. Um, uh, one skill set that I bring to the table um, is uh, facilitation uh, and, and meeting design. Um, it's when done well, it looks easy, um, but it occurred to me that uh, among the hackers um, and, and the other folk who attend Hope, um, those kinds of skills may feel uh, very alien, uh, may feel very different uh, than the kinds of skills um, that that you may see sort of um, that you may see around hope. All right, like I'm not going to be contributing anything to the Linux kernel anytime soon, um, but I can definitely teach people about how to facilitate a good meeting um, and and to uh, design um, sort of collaborative spaces. Um, I have a background in popular education, in participatory research, uh, in organizing. Um, I learned. Uh, facilitation uh, from community organizers over the period of several years. Um, so I'm just really excited to sort of bring some of this, uh, some, some of these skills to you all. Um, my, my hope is that you, some people on this talk uh, are, are already strong facilitators um, and, and sort of understand the value of meetings um, and, and collaborative spaces. And for those who already have those skill sets, this shouldn't, there shouldn't be anything terribly surprising in this. Uh, but for those who, you know, maybe programmers, software engineers, uh, who are in sales, I'm hoping that this this high level overview of what will make strong uh, meetings and facilitations, um, hopefully this is this is useful for you all. Um, so first, I should say, um, sort of the elephant in the room here is that meetings are usually terrible. Um, I, I trust that if you if you came to this workshop, you probably already have firsthand experience about you know, how, how tedious, how boring, um, sort of how unproductive meetings can be, uh, especially in corporate contexts, especially in um, uh, sort of organizational contexts where it just feels, you know, it can be really um, draining. Meetings can be really draining, really frustrating, um, really, you know, they can be toxic, frankly. Um, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to argue that uh, to, to, to tell you that all meetings, you know, can be wonderful and constructive. Um, there are a lot that m many meetings are just totally unproductive and same, you know, really just should be an email. Um, here are some common styles that I've noticed. Uh, this is not comprehensive. This is just sort of for, for my own, from for my own lived experience here. Uh, some common meeting styles that are just that totally stifle collaboration. Uh, the first I'm calling uh, command and control. Um, which is um, one where you've got someone sort of running the meeting and they kind of act like a dictator. Um, they, they control everything. They don't leave um, any space open for comments or criticisms uh, or questions. They just sort of um, demand things of people and expect them to sort of fall into line. Um, and, uh, you know, there is, there are contexts um, when that kind of sort of command structure, command and control structure is necessary. Um, like if, you know, for operational security or you're, you're, you're planning um, an event um, or what have you, um, there, there may be times when it's not, you're really not looking for collaboration. You're not looking for common, you're not looking for um, joint decision-making. You're just sort of looking to establish a line of communication um, so that information gets patent orders, so to speak, get passed down the line, but not, you know, not a collaborative style. Uh, then there's a meeting style that I would call like teacher and student, um, where someone shows up to a meeting that they're running and they're trying to sort of present people maybe with new information. This is, this presentation is sort of a teacher and student style, frankly, um, uh, where the, the person presents, they presents new information uh, to the people who attend the meeting. Uh, the people who do attend are sort of able to ask clarifying questions or able to bring up points of information, um, but there really isn't any collaboration there. It's just sort of like question and answer, um, you know, teacher with a capital T. Um, again, not, not very collaborative. 
the sort of failed focus group um, is is a lot like what a teacher and student meeting feels like, where someone's just sort of giving updates or you know uh, teaching people about a new thing and maybe leaving some time up for question and answer. Um, except um, there's more room for questions and criticisms about process and decision making. Uh, except um, there's no opportunity uh, for um, the people who are bringing up comments, criticisms, questions, there's no follow through. The, the, those kinds of comments just sort of go into an abyss, into, an avo into a void, um, and you sort of never hear back about it. Um, it's kind of like a focus group, except you don't, again, there's no, there's no feedback loop, there's no follow up. Um, one that I find particularly frustrating is a meeting. Um, I, I've seen this a lot in sort of like cross sector work. Um, we've got organizations representing um, like different interests coming from very different kinds of work. Um, and they sort of show up to a meeting and it's unclear whose meeting even is this? Like, why are we even here? Um, and it feels a lot like people are spinning their wheels um, in that regard. You know, Pete, there aren't any roles set. There's no clear facilitator. There's no agenda in advance. It's really just, um, you know, it's just people sort of showing up and then wasting an hour with each other. Uh, then uh, my favorite kind of meeting, and uh, truth be told, there's there's definitely um, some value in just having space, uh, whether there isn't any expectations for for moving something forward, uh, for moving decisions forward, uh, which I would just call goof off, uh, which is where everyone in the meeting knows that it's sort of a useless meeting and nothing will come of it. And it kind of, there's a kind of freedom in it where you, once you realize that you can sort of shoot the shit and then have conversations with each other. Um, but again, none of these are terribly uh, collaborative. Um, so the tips that I'm about to go through here in this workshop um, are designed for um, meetings where you are convening a group of people and the expectation is that you all are make you all are making a decision together. It's it's group decision making, joint decision making. It's collaboration, um, and it can be very muddy, uh, very messy. Um, it can there can there can be times when there's sort of much more confusion before there's clarity. Um, and these are the kinds of um, uh, these are the kinds of things you want to put in place um, if you want uh, to 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 actually have a collaborative space. Um, so um, what does a good meeting look like? Uh, these are just um, some examples that, that sort of come to mind from my own experiences here. So if a really bad meeting is toxic and draining and unproductive and frustrating and makes you want to, you know, fall asleep or try to escape the room as quickly as you can, uh, a good meeting, you'll walk out of there with greater clarity. You'll walk out of there feeling like it was productive and constructive. You'll walk out of there with more energy than when you walked in. Um, very focused, um, and it's also very respectful. So good meetings, collaborative meetings, you know, should be free of, um, you know, microaggressions and sort of petty, petty politics um, and sort of jockeying for attention and jockeying for power. Um, th those things are sort of hard to control in advance, but ideally, like, I guess if there's anything I want to impart upon the people watching this workshop right now, it's that there, there is such a thing as a good meeting. Right, um, especially among organizers and people who want to collaborate on decision making, it is possible to have constructive meetings. Um, uh, so here's how. Uh, first, um, good meetings have facilitators. Um, we, uh, facilitator plays a special role in a meeting. Um, they usually uh, do not weigh in. Uh, they don't come with a specific argument that they want to be making. Uh, they don't come sort of trying to um, position their own, um, you know, their own work above or um, in front of others. It's really to sort of keep the conversation moving. And it's almost like a, it's a, it's like a, it's part of a project manager's skill set, I would say, if um, for those of you who are familiar with, um, with project management. Um, so a facilitator, special role, um, should be decided in advance and there should be some preparation that happens in advance. Um, in addition to a facilitator, it's also good to have a separate uh, person who's a, who's a note taker, uh, who's documenting the meeting as it's happening. Um, I, you know, skilled facilitators, you know, a lot of the times they'll just take their own notes um, or they'll whiteboard the conversation as it's unfolding. Um, it is definitely less of a burden for the facilitator to have a separate note taker. Um, I would also say, depending on the uh, who's in the room for that meeting, uh, you can have sort of 
uh, what would you call it? Like uh, ro um, uh, rolling facilitators and rolling note takers. So one person isn't always the note taker. One person isn't always the facilitator. And that sort of brings, that, that brings shared responsibility among the group. So for me, I have um, a clear agenda in advance. Um, if it's a meeting that's occurring, maybe you want to have a standing agenda, uh, which is broken out like, you know, a classic example would be from Robert's Rules for, you know, old business, new business, other, other standing items. And there should be clear roles such as facilitator and note taker. Um, clear outcomes. Uh, what is it that the meeting is actually trying to accomplish? Um, I can't. I can't tell you um, how many meetings I've been in where it's been a standing meeting for so long that people don't even remember what it is they're supposed to be trying to get out of that meeting once they're in the space. Those are, it feels a lot like spinning your wheels. Uh, so you should have clear outcomes, a clear agenda, um, and then clear priorities. Um, and you want to have clear priorities because um, there are going to be situations uh, where you'll have competing priorities. And in that case, you'll want to have a process for consensus and a process for time management. And I'll go into both of those uh, in a moment. <clears throat> so um, if, the, if these are tips about making uh, decisions collaboratively uh, among a group of, of you know, sort of interested stakeholders, um, pe people who are coming together intentionally for the purposes of, of say organizing for collaboration, how do decisions get made in those meetings? Uh, the most common one uh, that I've seen, and this is not particularly productive, um, is uh, the clock. The, the clock makes the decisions for everyone. Um, it's extremely frustrating. Uh, what tends to happen is uh, you'll, you may have a standing meeting, say it meets you know, every, other, every two weeks or something like that. And everyone just, the, the agenda is packed. It's packed full of stuff and really important items get like five minutes on the agenda. So the agenda, of course, always runs late. So, you know, uh, other items eat into some important issue and there's only like two minutes left for that conversation. And then once that two minutes is up, someone says, well, we wanna be mindful of everyone's time. And then the conversation is shut down. No decisions are really made. It just, it's just sort of like you're, you're um, feels like you're walking in, uh, through mud or something like that. Like the clock is the decision maker. There's not a clear, there's not a clear decision maker um, role there. So that's quite frustrating. Um, other other uh, other ways of making decisions in meetings is in advance you just decide um, that some one person is the decision maker for the process. Uh, often you'll see that sort of get reflected in the hierarchy of an organization. So sort of whoever it is you know, the highest paid person or, the, you know, who, who has the, the VP in front of their name or whatever, um, they, they'll make the decisions for the meeting or they'll be the ones in charge of ultimately getting it to a decision maker. Um, again, not terribly collaborative and it tends to um, sort of rise or fall based on, you know, how much that decision maker is actually listening to the people uh, who are participating in that meeting. Like how open is is that person to feedback um, and, and to, uh, to to the conversation? Then there's like a highest score. Um, I see this a lot in meetings, which which uh, rely on uh, techniques from human centered design. Uh, so a classic example would be like you put up um, a bunch of competing priorities about like, uh, for example, like what, what is the theme of a campaign that you're trying to organize, and you're trying to figure out the wording for a campaign. You give everybody a bunch of uh, stickers. You write up the different themes on a poster board or on a whiteboard, um, on a you know flip chart paper. You write it up on flip chart paper, and then people take their dots, their stickers, and they put they put their stickers next to the to the theme that they want. And whichever theme has sort of the most stickers at the end of it, that's that's how the decision is made. It's it's a little bit like majority rules, um, except it's possible not to have a full majority of, of, um, uh, of the people in the meeting. It's just sort of which got the most. Um, majority rules, as it sounds, that, I've, that usually um, I see that happen uh, with like a, what's called like a Roman vote, which is like a very simple um, thumbs up, thumbs down. What do you all think about this decision? And then if there are some critical mass of, thumbs up, then you move forward with the decision. If there's a thumbs down, you, you don't move forward with that decision. 
Uh, fist to five uh, is um, is a is a pretty strong technique um, for collaborative spaces. Uh, I would I would advocate for using this method to coming to decisions um, to to coming to collaborative decisions. Uh, the way it works is uh, instead of like a Roman vote where you have like a yes no, um, you have everyone who's in the meeting. Um, do a little prep work in advance by learning this method. And the idea is that when you come to a decision point in the meeting, you ask people to sort of present a fist to five and really it's like a Likert scale vote. Um, so a zero is a fist and then one all the way up to five. And the idea is that if you, um, for a particular decision or for a next step, if you put up a five or a four, uh, it means that you're not only do you agree with that decision, where you're also willing to lead with that decision. Uh, you're, you're able to sort of lead with the completion of that next step. Um, three, uh, two uh, is more of like, okay, like I'll, I'll go forward with this decision, but I'm not really comfortable leading it or being responsible for the next steps or the deliverables associated with it. Uh, and then finally you have a zero or a one. Um, a zero would be like, um, I've seen some, some processes where a zero is just a straight up veto. And then everyone has veto power on a decision being like, no, I'm not comfortable with this. This is the wrong direction for this group. We're not doing it. You put up a fist. Um, the other method of doing that would be um, you put up a fist and you say, I'm not comfortable moving forward until we talk about what I think is wrong with this decision. And then you don't actually move forward until that person is willing to give like a two or three uh, votes in the fist of five. Um, this one is time intensive uh, and it requires a lot of trust um, and sort of openness um, among the people who are part of the conversation. Uh, it is definitely worth it though. It, it, allows, um, it allows tensions and challenges um, and difficulties to surface. And it also creates a space to discuss um, how to move forward together. Uh, finally, uh, this is the the hard one, this is the hardest one of all in my experience. And I, I have facilitated a lot of meetings um, and uh, reaching full consensus uh, on hard issues, like reaching full consensus on like, should we break for lunch? Um, you know, that's that's not too hard, right? But reaching full consensus about like, what should we do with the resources that we bring to the table? What should we do about the campaign that we're organizing together? That takes a lot of time and effort um, and you need, to create the time and space in the conversation. Uh, if that's really your goal to reach full consensus, um, you, ne you need to sort of honor that and create, like, it takes the amount of time that it takes. Uh, if you say, okay, in the next 10 minutes, we're gonna reach full consensus on this, you've, you've definitely hamstrung yourself. Um, it'll be much harder to do. Um, I'll, I should say at this juncture, uh, if you have questions, uh, please just drop them in the chat and, and we'll go to, and I've left a bunch of, uh, uh, time at the end for question and answer here. So those are some ways of making decisions. Um, the, the key here is that everyone who is part of the collaborative decision-making process um, should agree on the decision-making process. People should uh, at least have consensus about process. Um, okay, so you've got a group of stakeholders together um, and, uh, you know, say you're organizing a campaign um, and you want to get um, sort of a, a regular meeting in order uh, to, to advance the work. Uh, here are 10, again, not comprehensive, but I think it's, if you were to answer all of these, these would put you in pretty good shape, especially for sort of meetings that are tied into other kinds of movement building and organizing. Um, here are 10 questions. One, uh, does this really need to be a meeting? Really? Does it really need to be a meeting? A ask that a bunch at the outset. Um, there are, as you are prob you probably well know, um, there are lots of meetings that could simply have just been an email, uh, could have simply just been a telephone call. Um, so address that at the outset. Is this re do we really need people to come together face to face or over Zoom now um, to to make this decision together? How long does this meeting have to be? Um, it's going to be hard to get people to commit to a recurring meeting. Um, if they don't know how much time it's actually going to take um, uh, to, to take from their calendars. Uh, so this is like length, not only in like how long does each individual meeting have to be, but like how many times do we need to meet in order to actually make this decision together or make these series of decisions together? That should be something that you may not have that done exactly, right? Like you want to like leave room for um, 
to, to iterate on this after the first one, but you want to at least have a sense, right? Like, do we have to meet every month for a year to do this or do we just need to meet twice? And that's, that'll be enough. Um, what is the purpose of this meeting? Um, the purpose um, shouldn't just be like pie in the sky, um, you know, because, you know, we want to meet because we want to see, you know, positive social change in the world. Uh, it should be very concrete. Uh, it should be the outcomes of the decisions you make during these meetings should um, be measurable, um, meaning like uh, they can be measurable in the sense of like, did this thing happen? Yes or no. But it can also be measurable in the sense of like, we want to uh, get 200 people to show up to this event. That's the good. That's this is like an this is a meeting about outreach. So that's that's how we want to organize this. It should be clear at the outset to the facilitator. It should be clear at the outset for the people who are attending the meeting. Uh, I already mentioned uh, what is the process for decision making. Again, um, I really can't stress this enough. This this should be very clear to people um, in advance. If there isn't any process for decision making in place in advance, you're going to end up spending a bunch of your precious time together, circling the drain and sort of vying for the last word. Um, you just it just has to be clear and it has to be agreed upon. Um, so similar to the purpose. How do we know whether we've actually achieved um, the end that we are setting up uh, uh, to achieve? Um, again, so that that's why it needs to be measurable. Um, and it can be very simple and straightforward in terms of the measurement. It could be, you know, uh, much more complicated, like with collective impact initiatives um, or sort of movement building and organizing. Um, the, the purpose that is achieved can be like, you know, lobbying for legislation. Um, it could be fundraising. Uh, it could uh, be consciousness raising, right? It could be a lot of things, but you should at least have a sense of whether, how will you know whether you've in fact succeeded at it? Uh, how much preparation do participants need to do beforehand? Um, I would say that you should expect, you shouldn't expect people to do the reading. Uh, that That doesn't, you know, unless it's like a very, very high stakes meeting uh, where there's a bunch of resources in question at the table, like, you know, how $10 million or whatever is going to get moved. Um, you shouldn't really expect people to have done their homework. Um, and for that reason, when you're building an agenda, you should spend a little bit of time at the beginning, just summarizing what it is um, that people, <laughs> the, like a few high level takeaways about the preparation that they should have done beforehand. Um, this, there's like preparation in terms of like content, uh, like what kind of content do people need to have sort of, what do they need to be familiar with beforehand? But in terms of like the decision-making, clear roles, what the agenda is, that, sh that stuff, everyone really needs to get on the same page on. Uh, I added question seven, specifically in the context of movement building um, and, and, and uh, people who are interested in organizing collaborative spaces with an equity lens. Uh, an important question to ask yourself is, who isn't at this table who should be? Who, who should be part of this decision-making process that for whatever we, reason we have left out? And if we've left out a key stakeholder, how is it that we, that we bring them to the table in a sort of an authentic, equitable way? Um, and how, how do we get that, that person, that organization here? Um, that, that part is really important. And likely this question will also reveal to you um, that there are plenty of other people in the space that you're working in who've been doing the work already. Uh, so especially in the context of like an organizing campaign, um, there, ten, there likely is somebody who's already out there doing that. And this question, um, in addition to sort of broadening your base or broadening the perspectives that you're bringing to the table, also sort of lets you do a quick landscape scan about who, who is it that's already doing this work and we could potentially collaborate with. I touched on number eight already. Um, who's assuming the roles uh, of facilitator and documenter. Uh, again, that needs to be set out in advance because uh, the facilitator uh, should be in charge of this question nine, um, which is what, what's actually on the agenda. Uh, I would recommend that that be done like a week in advance, maybe, maybe a little bit less, uh, but you should have a finalized agenda at least 24 hours before the meeting is set to happen. Um, and that that's on the facilitator um, and the documenter and note taker. Then finally, um, similarly to a decision-making process and sort of having that in place for your meetings, uh, you want to have a process and a space for debriefing uh, because a lot of times, especially when you're bringing um, diverse stakeholders to the table who may have different interests at heart, um, 
that it may not go well. The first couple of meetings may not be very productive at all. It may, may not feel good, but uh, you have, you still have a commitment to keep it going. So how do you course correct? How do you iterate on your processes uh, to make, to make things more productive? Um, so those, if you were able to answer these 10 questions uh, before you set a sort of a standing meeting, um, especially, you know, in these collaborative spaces, uh, you'd be in, you'd be in pretty good shape. Um, obviously there's a lot, there's a lot of work that goes into it, but these will get you pretty far. Okay. Um, so you've got your stakeholders. Um, you, you have decided yes, indeed, we want to have a meeting. We want to have a standing meeting about this. Um, what do you, what do you do? Um, first, and I've touched on this a bit, uh, is the, is the time actually appropriate? Um, this is related to the second bullet point about a clear agenda. If you're having an hour-long meeting, what is a realistic number of items to talk about during that one-hour time? Um, that I see that you know I see people just try to like jam in way, way, way too much, and the time no longer becomes appropriate, and the agenda just gets all muddled, and people lose focus. Similar to the decision-making processes that we've discussed, uh, I would say that. <clears throat> um, this 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 can be a little difficult, uh, but or prioritize your agenda based on what is most urgent or what's most important for you all to collaborate on a decision, like for you all to make a decision on collaboratively. Because um, that way, if you have it sort of ranked, an agenda that's ranked like that, it means that okay, you, you think that we, that the beginning conversation will take fifteen minutes, but you have the agenda that's ranked. If it goes over that 15 minutes, everyone in the room already knows that it may be worthwhile to just go to take that conversation as long as it needs to go in order to come to consensus or to come to a decision. Um, so clear agenda, appropriate time. Make sure that everyone has the agenda beforehand. Um, you know, not everyone is responsive to email. So bring, um, assuming you're all meeting in per person, um, uh, you know, print out the agenda beforehand, write up the agenda on flip chart paper. Um, it allows people to sort of um, stay on track. For very long meetings, like I would say more than two hours, have food. Um, have, have Like people need to need sustenance, like have food, have water, have juice, whatever. Um, it also shows, especially if your meetings are around lunchtime or dinner time or breakfast time, and if you can afford it, um, it's just a nice thing to have. And even having a potluck is a good way of doing a little community building uh, among the people in your space. Uh, translation. Um, I, I've done a lot of uh, work in, in communities where, you know, English is, is definitely not commonly spoken. Uh, so do you have the resources in place uh, to pay for a translator? Uh, if you're unable to pay for a translator, can you find a translation service that will do it pro bono? If you don't, if you don't have access to either of those things, do you know someone who can help translate um, that meeting for you? And it can sometimes it can be, um, you know, you may need multiple translators, right? If it's especially if it's a larger meeting uh, with people who speak a variety of languages. Um, the tech, uh, technology wise, I've seen it work well where each translator has a little like. Uh, like headphones and walkie talkie and anyone who needs that translation picks up a headset and they listen to a real time translation. Uh, I should also add that uh, for um, meetings where there is translation occurring, it is even more important that you leave enough time in your agenda so that you are sure <clears throat> that everyone in the room is comprehending and is sort of um, uh, is comprehending the decisions that are on the table. Uh, you, it's okay to have um, silence in meetings, if that's what it means for like people to sort of catch up with the translation. Uh, it's absolutely crucial that you, that you leave that, that time. Um, offer ground rules. Uh, this is, I know this is hope. Um, so maybe not the most, uh, uh, sort of touchy feely audience. Um, but having ground rules or guiding principles at the beginning of the meeting, um, and I'll go through some examples in a moment. You can call them ground rules, guiding principles, uh, having them at the beginning of the meeting, going through them, and then offering the opportunity for people to chime in with their own ground rules that they want to see for how that meeting, the tone of the meeting, the process for the meeting, how people should behave toward one another during that meeting. It, it really does make a difference. Um, and it really, uh, I've seen it make a huge difference, um, especially in meetings where there are sort of, um, 
people with very uh, problematic personality. I shouldn't say problematic personalities. People who have um, confrontational or defensive personalities for whatever reason, or that's the attitude they take during your meeting, just being able to, to, to point to your ground rules and say, hey, I hear you, but maybe this isn't the time for that conversation. Or, hey, I hear you. Can we stick to what's on the agenda? Uh, it allows you to sort of cut through any interpersonal dynamics or power imbalances that might exist between you and that person. Um, and it allows it to sort of not be, um, really not, just not be personal, right? So people don't take it personal. Um, similarly, again, I'll repeat, I know this is hope um, and uh, not touchy-feely, but icebreakers um, are great. Uh, icebreakers are um, excellent, especially uh, uh, for, for meetings where it's the first time people have met in a long time, the first time people have met at all, um, a great way to get to know each other. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, an icebreaker is like, you know, a simple game, like a fun, energizing game or activity or sort of fun question that you ask people around the table. It gives people a chance to introduce themselves. It sort of allows people to um, hear from one another without so much high stakes in the room. Uh, and also crucially, I should say tactically, um, icebreakers allow you to pad your agenda at the top with like five to 10 minutes um, to let people who are late arrive and arrive without feeling like they need to sort of apologize, arrive in a way that gives them the space to sort of be there in the present with you. Um, and it also uh, gives you time in case uh, you need uh, uh, to sort of shift things in the agenda based on who shows up or not. Um, that's It's really crucial time for the facilitator, but also it's just a good thing for people to get to know each other. Um, I touched on this earlier a bit uh, about the sort of the agenda and the appropriate time piece. Uh, but just go through the agenda until everyone feels comfortable that that the conversation has been the the that particular item on the agenda has actually been addressed. Uh, that that could be a hard thing, especially with sort of like this this tyranny of the clock uh, that I see again and again, especially in uh, project management spaces uh, for technology development, uh, for software development, like web application development. I see that all the time. Uh, it's totally toxic, and it's not a good way. Um, at least to collaborate. It might be a good way to like launch a product, but uh, it's not a good way. Uh, it might be efficient time-wise, but it's not actually collaborative. And then finally, leave room at the end of your agenda uh, for reflection. Like it's, it's, it's actually good community building and team building for people to be like, I thought that meeting went really well, or, you know, I think we should be doing this differently. Um, it's, it's just good uh, uh, for people to sort of get to know each other that way as well. Um, so building time for reflection and next steps, always end your meetings with, with your next steps. The next steps should be, you should go through them multiple times, make sure that everyone is clear about who is responsible for what next step or what piece of the deliverable and make sure that you leave room to ask, you know, did we miss anything here? Was there a next step that we forgot to include um, in our note taking just in case something was in fact missed? Um, additionally, leaving time at the end for reflection next steps allows you to sort of pad the agenda in case something runs long or not. Um, a classic technique uh, for uh, reflection, especially process-wise, like you want to know how, how, how well the meeting went, um, is, a, is a tool called pluses and deltas or pluses and minuses. Um, but I, I prefer, uh, I'll explain it first. So pluses and minuses, you put up on flip chart paper or a whiteboard, you sort of debrief the meeting with everyone who's there. Uh, you say all the things that sort of went well. Hey, the facilitator did a great job. Hey, this was super clarifying. Uh, and then you can pass the pluses and the minuses are obviously, um, hey, this thing didn't go so well. I wish we had food or whatever. Um, the reason that I like to refer to it as pluses and deltas is because um, the framing of a delta, meaning like pluses and, and things we would change, is that people who have, who think that things should be done differently it not only calls out the thing, like, you know, there should have been food. Um, the delta uh, angle allows you to sort of ask, okay, uh, what should we be doing differently then in order to correct for that, for that uh, mistake or, for, or to correct for that, for that wrong process? Um, so pluses and deltas is a way to begin it. That's a pretty, you know, your meetings can look like this. You know, obviously there's, there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of creativity here. But if you have these things, you've asked your questions about why the hell we're even meeting in the first place. And you have these uh, meeting design tips sort of done and, and ready in advance. Um, it should be a productive meeting. 
Um, here are some example ground rules uh, or guiding principles. Again, this is just sort of like to sort of set the tone and 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 give people a chance to to reflect on the process and like what it will mean to actually sit in a room together and collaborate on a decision together. Um, uh, be present. Uh, that is much harder than it sounds. Uh, a lot of people um, will, another way of putting this, uh, maybe maybe more appropriate for the help audience here would be, um, you know, get off your laptop or get off your phone. Like don't, don't be checking Twitter. Don't, don't be checking your email. Actually be present for this conversation. Uh, speak from your own experience and hear others. Uh, this would be in the context, especially of like uh, organizing, movement building, um, so that people don't feel uh, cornered or attacked when they are they're coming with a very different perspective in that space. Uh, you want to acknowledge that uh, acknowledge that fact, acknowledge that difference. That people may be starting in different places, they may have different interests, um, and that your the goal isn't to just sort of. I see this a lot in meetings, right, where the the it's the agenda is so packed, the decision making process is so unclear. Um, that people will just sort of chime in with like the one point that they want to get across. The one thing that they want, that they, they came to that meeting that they just wanted to try to convey. And it's not actually a conversation. It's not actually a dialogue. It's not constructive. So this point about hearing others is important because it's, it reminds people that in fact, it should be a dialogue. It should be something where you're learning from each other and potentially changing your, your perspectives and your beliefs because of it. Similar to the point here, listen to understand uh, share to be understood. Um, I see a lot of people, um, I, I work a lot in sort of like um, community and like at the intersection of like community-based research and uh, academic research. So I have seen in the past um, academics come into community spaces. Actually, I've seen this a lot uh, in organizing crypto parties, right? You've got uh, a tech, uh, you know a, a software engineer who comes into a community space among a bunch of activists um, and they're not really there to hear about what the activists need in terms of their expertise. They're there just to sort of feel like they're the smartest person in the room. Um, so putting this out at the front, listen to understand, share to be understood. Again, sort of reminds people that it should be a dialogue. Um, it, it, it really is, you know, it should come from a place of empathy. No one knows everything. Together we know a lot. Uh, I, I reflect on this uh, quite a bit because uh, I've seen time and time again, um, that it that when people listen to each other uh, and and collaboratively make decisions together, you will come to uh, you will come to places. You'll you'll surface new ideas that simply no one in the room expected when they showed up to that meeting. Um, and that sort of a, a affirming that together as a group we're sort of you know more powerful than just us as individual units. Uh, that that can get people energized. Uh, move up, move back, um, also referred to as like step up, step back, uh, is especially among standing meetings. Uh, if you're in the room with uh, somebody who, uh, let's say like they're the, they run an organization or whatever, or they've got a gigantic ego or whatever, um, and they're used to sucking up all the air in the room, um, they're used to, you know, an hour long meeting talking for uh, 30 minutes of it or whatever. Uh, this is a reminder that if you find yourself um, being the one who's always talking in the meeting, take this opportunity to take a step back or move back and let other voices into that space without dominating it. Uh, similarly, if you find yourself, you know, not chiming in a lot, maybe this is an opportunity to, to bring your voice to the table and bring your insights to the table. Uh, one mic, uh, meaning like, you know, don't interrupt each other, don't talk over each other. Uh, this is stuff that, you know, like a lot of young people, like children are learning with social and emotional intelligence curriculum, but it's like, you know, like, you know, behave, right? Like have, have, con like have respectful conversations with one another. Uh, no soapboxing. So similar to move up, move back. Um, this isn't like, this isn't the moment uh, to, to proselytize or to sort of wax poetic about a thing. Um, it really should be a collaborative open space. And then finally, uh, keep time together. Uh, usually this is, um, like a, a note taker will be the person who does like a time check being like time check. You know, we were five minutes over on this agenda item. Um, but mentioning this as the ground rules that everyone agrees to uh, means that, you know, people, uh, people should, should try to keep like everyone is responsible for keeping everyone else on track. 
So you don't go out on left field with a thing. You don't sort of relitigate items that have already been decided on uh, for the interest of trying to move through the agenda. So again, these are just example ground rules. Um, you can put it up on flip chart paper, um, but it's good to have it present at every meeting. Um, and it's good for everyone to agree on it uh, so that you can point you can point to them like, hey, you know, so-and-so, I see, like, are you really present right now? Like, I see that you're chuckling about a, you know, a meme on Twitter or whatever, right? Uh, so those are some ground rules. Okay, uh, I, I expect that this might be one of the more challenging, uh, more more challenging parts of effective meeting design and facilitation uh, for this audience in particular, uh, which is like what what style do you actually bring into a meeting when you're a facilitator? Um, I myself am an introvert. Um, I, I find it uh, to, to be very challenging to, to talk in front of a lot of people. Um, and it's not, you know, how a facilitator actually facilitates is really a matter of sort of personal preference and comfort. Like if you don't want to be cracking jokes or whatever, then don't. Um, if you want, um, you know, if you want to, you know, be more earnest or, so or somber in your attitude, like that's fine. Like it really is about what is it that you need uh, to feel supported uh, in that space? Like, you know, it's, it's sort of your own style. Um, but here are a few things that I've, that I found are helpful. Um, be respectful. So again, like a facilitator for a meeting, they shouldn't come with their own agenda. Um, they should come really as someone who tries to move the collaborative process forward. Um, and that can be, especially when the interpersonal dynamics are super thick, um, especially when you've got gigantic egos in the room, um, it can uh, it can be hard to sort of maintain that kind of like a non judgmental attitude, but it is really important because if people feel like the facilitator is trying to steer the conversation or like trying to steer the outcome one way, then it can really shut down the process because uh, the facilitator, believe it or not, has a fair amount of power um, in these in these kinds of decisions. Having a sense of humor uh, again, like just keeps people at ease if if you can. Um, another way of thinking about it would be like you know, it's a meeting, right? Like you don't, you don't have to take it like that seriously, right? Like you're not going into surgery or whatever. Like it's, it's okay to, um, you know, be playful. It's okay to, you know, tease a little bit if you, if you have that trust um, already built with people who are in the meeting, um, it's okay. Um, and it's okay for it to be fun too. Uh, stick to the process and keep time. Uh, I would say as a facilitator, um, these, these, the last four items are basically what you're doing the entire meeting. Uh, so if it's an hour long meeting, what you're doing at the outset, you're making sure everyone agrees on the agenda. You're setting up your ground rules. You're reminding people about what the decision-making process is for a particular decision. You're keeping the agenda moving. You're keeping the conversation on track. Um, and crucially, um, when there is a lull in, in the conversation, in the decision-making process, you can take some space and remind people about what's already, what have we already agreed upon, right? What work have we already done um, to move to move the decision uh, together? And it reminds people, one, they in fact can make decisions together. And two, it gets people thinking about sort of like what comes next? What's, what's the next uh, piece that, that we have to put in place for this all to work? Um, again, don't offer judgment, offer synthesis. Um, this is a... <clears throat> Uh, a, a sort of more art than science uh, can, can be a balancing act because a lot of times offering synthesis of what you've heard during a conversation um, can feel a lot like you're making a judgment uh, and it can sound like that too if you're not if you're not careful um, but by synthesis what what I mean is you want to as best as you can like let's say there are two competing viewpoints during a collaborative decision making process to offer synthesis, what you can do is uh, say there are just two sides. <clears throat> you you state as plainly and clearly as you can the differences between the two sides and why it is that that the difference exists, like where each side is coming from. And then you offer, and this takes some creativity, uh, you offer uh, a middle way or you offer uh, a process check um, or you offer um, the people there uh, with a potential idea uh, about how to resolve that conflict. Um, it doesn't always work, obviously, but at least 
it gives people something to, to sink their teeth into. Uh, because believe me, when, when you're at, uh, when you're in a, when you're in a meeting and you're trying to come to a decision and there, it seems like you're at, uh, like a juncture. Um, if you just say, well, what should we do? Um, it, it leads pe- people tend not to, uh, for, for a lot of reasons, right? People tend not to chime in with solutions. Better to offer a solution, even if it's not the right one down the road. Better to offer a solution for people to riff on, um, or offer a synthesis for people to riff on, and then that will sort of get the creative process moving, um, and, and sort of let you know that, that may sort of get you out of a log jam. Uh, okay, this is in quotes here is, is probably, and then I'll leave time for some some Q and A here. Um, in quotes here, say more about that. Th- this may be the most important phrase, the, the most important tool uh, that a facilitator has. Um, it's very simple, um, and uh, it is it is a, a key to surfacing new ideas, uh, to surfacing differences in perspectives among the people who are there. Um, uh, and uh, what tends to happen is. Um, you'll, you'll see during a meeting, someone will offer an idea. Uh, someone might offer a disagree, uh, they may disagree with that idea. Right. Um, and, uh, in meetings where there isn't a clear process where there isn't a clear decision maker or a decision making process, um, where the agenda is all jammed up, someone may feel, uh, uh, too insecure to provide their reasoning. They've just, they may feel like they only have the wherewithal or the time to interject that they disagree. Uh, but when you have the sort of the space as a facilitator to say, okay, hold, pause, pause the conversation. I hear that you've disagreed with this point or I hear that you're bringing this new perspective to the table. Why is it that you say that? Can, can you say more about that? Um, it's just a, a super easy, super collaborative thing to do. And, and you'd be really surprised um, uh, uh, with how effective it is. Um, okay. So I, I moved through a lot here um, and I know it's, it's already 10 of, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a moment. Um, I'll give a plug that you can find me on Twitter there. Um, I do take contracts, uh, if you find yourself, um, sort of in an organization that is in desperate need of a facilitator to, to move through a strategic decision, let me know. Um, and I'll do a quick summary here. I'll go back to the beginning. Um, so good meetings are usually terrible as you probably know. Um, they don't have to be terrible. Here are some ways that you can make them less terrible. Uh, the, the biggest one is that meetings should have roles and there should be a facilitator for collaborative decision-making processes. Um, the meeting should have clear outcomes. They should have clear priorities. Uh, there should be a process for consensus and a process for time management. Um, a, v- a variety of ways of making decisions together. Um, full consensus is the hardest one, um, but probably the most effective and, and the cleanest way of sort of cr- keeping the group together to make decisions, even if it's very difficult. Um, here are some questions that if you are saying, okay, I, you know, I watched this, this workshop at Hope. Um, I know a bunch of hackers who want to collaborate, uh, you know, around a campaign about, you know, uh, disinvesting from fossil fuels or something like that, right? Um, if you want to start that collaboration, you know that you think, you think that they would be able to, you know, come together for at least six months, ask these questions, um, put these processes in place, and you'll be much more effective. Um, meeting design, uh, have ground rules, do icebreakers if you don't uh, know each other, make sure you have an agenda. Um, have ground rules. Again, I know it sounds silly or sort of touchy-feely, but like they're, they're, they're equitable. They're, uh, it's, it's an equitable thing to have in your space. Um, and they're also super effective. And then finally, your facilitator style should, should be yours. Uh, you should feel confident going into that space. Um, and like you have what you need to succeed as a facilitator. And then, you know, last but not least, say more about that. That phrase is your friend. Um, and we'll, and we'll, and you'll learn a lot just by asking that. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hit me up on Twitter if you want. Um, and then I hopefully you all have some questions. Um, and I'll see you right now. Really, really appreciate you all coming to this and, and taking your time. Okay, let me see here. I see lots, lots of checking. Y'all, Jasmine, can you all still hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay, thanks. Okay.
Were you able to pull any of these? I've sent you the couple questions so far in your by message. Ah, great. How how I see. Thank you. How far? Here's one question. Um, how far in advance should agendas be sent out, and should and should you cancel if the agenda is sent out too close to start time? Um, so two questions there. Uh, you know, it, it really like that that if it is a standing meeting uh, where people it's the same people coming together. Um, uh, and sort of already sort of have a consensus about what they're working on. It can it can be less it can be sort of less time between the finalization of the agenda um, and when it's sent out. Um, to the extent that it's like a new group of people or it's a really large unwieldy group, uh, the more time the better. Uh, but that said, um, if if you're comfortable with this co collaboration wise, you know leave room in the agenda in case there is something urgent that has come up in the time since you finalized it to when the meeting actually starts, um, or there's just something that's been like, there's been an oversight and you've missed something, you can leave time, like leave space in case anyone has anything else to bring into it. Uh, and should you cancel if the agenda is sent out too close to start time? No, you don't have to cancel, but um, note it like process wise, remind people be like, oh, sorry about it, you know, really busy week. Next time you'll have the agenda sooner. Um, question. How do you keep people from ar armchair quarterbacking areas outside of their role? Like the accounting having to explain GAAP to the IT director because he saw something on YouTube. Um, very funny. Uh, um, so uh, I would, um, this is a great question. Um, and this is also useful in the context of like mansplaining. Um, I would put as a ground rule, um, something like, uh, like stay in your lane um, or sort of like, um, like, you know, um, honor, honor your role or something like that. So that people, um, know, uh, that like, you know, to, to, or maybe put something like this, like, like no, no armchair quarterbacking, like just, just write that up as your ground rule. Uh, and then when someone inevitably does it, remind them that like, you know, that maybe this isn't the time for it. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. It's, it's a very good one and it can be tough. Um, cause like, you know, especially in the context of man, mansplaining. So I, I would try to point, yeah, I would write something like no armchair, no armchair philosophers, no armchair quarterbacking. Um, very funny though. That's, I, I laugh only because I've seen it many times. Um, question, uh, in work situations where an outside facilitator is not possible, who can facilitate? Because all employees will have their own interests, agendas based on their job at the organization, and it will be hard to be non-judgmental. Oh, that is a great question. Um, I would, uh, in these situations, uh, where it's obvious that you need, um, you need some facilitated conversation, but you don't have the resources to hire a facilitator. Um, I would just surface that itself, um, and sort of ask people, um, ask, uh, ask whether anyone's willing to volunteer, um, or say, you know, maybe you do have the resources for a quick training. Like I'll, I'll train you on facilitation. Like, let me know. Um, so that people feel like they have at least some skills about it. Uh, and then the, another, another technique here would be to have uh, sort of the rotating facilitator role uh, to the extent that it doesn't, like you don't have someone like, let's say you're making a big decision about the IT budget or whatever. You don't have the person in charge of that budget facilitating that conversation, just with being intentional about that. Um, uh, yes, the slides will be available after the presentation. Um, and I've got one more question here. I know we're almost out of time. Um, I, I'll contact the Hope people to make sure that these slides get up. Um, you can also hit me up on Twitter. I'm happy to share them with you. Um, question. I understand this is for when we host the meetings. However, when we attend other meetings, there's times where people are conflictive towards the jobs to be done uh, or people hounding you for a response and commitment. Do you have any suggesting for implementing enforcing some boundaries in these cases? Um, <clears throat> that's really tough. Um, especially like when there's that open conflict um, or like that, that kind of sort of like toxic hound, like describing as hounding you for responses and, and commitment. Um, in that case um, you can have, I would recommend um, assuming it's, you know, again, it's like this tyranny of the clock, right? Where like everything's urgent. Everything has to be done now. There's no time for reflection. There's no time for debriefing. There's no process checks. I would try to advocate for having a specific meeting um, sort of about the process, like the project management process 
uh, about the roles um, and sort of who gets to decide what for whom, um, who gets to um, hound others, right? Like that kind of thing. Like, so sort of, again, it's kind of like a staying in your lane question, um, but that's a really hard conversation, right? Um, and I guess I would, I would say like those kinds of challenging conversations happen and they can be really tough in the moment, um, but they can also be really productive and it can, especially with a team where there's, there's conflict there. Um, uh, you can, you know, you can hire a uh, conflict uh, resolution consultant, but just clearing the air and surfacing the stuff can go a long way. Cause a lot of the times the people who are hounding you or who had that conflict conflict oriented attitude, sometimes it's just like second nature. Sometimes it's just, they're like, their the, their habit, like their workplace habits. And they may not even realize that it's a toxic thing to do. So just doing a check, a process check may, may go a long way. Um, Question about handling latecomers or if you're running late yourself. Um, when you come late yourself, you know, apologize um, and also thank people for their patience uh, and for handling latecomers to a meeting. That is a great question. And in collaborative spaces specifically, someone comes in late to a meeting, you know, they're not they're not cast with a friendly ghost. Like they walk in, acknowledge that they've walked in, be friendly, say hello, welcome as they're settling in give them a quick update, like a quick, like 30 second update about what's happened so far in the meeting. So that they feel like they're not like sort of playing catch up because what they need in order to be productive is to not feel rushed and sort of flurrying around so that they have enough time to actually arrive and be present in that space. Um, so acknowledge, make them feel welcome and make sure they have what they need to sort of be caught up. And I think last question time-wise, um, would you love suggestions to help discourage standing meetings, to have standing meetings, especially when the person organizing is either a supervisor or, an enti- or from an entirely different team. The response do we need this meeting doesn't always work. Um, winking emoji. Uh, ain't that the truth? Uh, that can be um, really tough, uh, especially if like you're sort of forced into it. I don't, you know, that that's something it sounds like that this could be like a hierarchy culture, um, like a dominant culture, hierarchy, dominant culture. Uh, I would do your best to either talk uh, like, you know, get a sense, get a sense of the room about who, who's in that room that probably feels the same way you do um, and see whether you can organize among yourselves to like strategize about, OK, who in the organization has the power to change how this meeting is formatted, to change whether it's a standing meeting and what are the best messages that will convince that person uh, that this does not need to be a meeting, right? That this can just be an email. Uh, but I can I can hear you. I, I know we're at time. Um, thank you all um, f- for your time. Uh, hit me up on Twitter. Um, and, you know, here's to not having so many more terrible meetings. Really appreciate it.